I always travel with some wine. So, and I figured it's the last panel of the day. Let's and it's Let's it's early. five o'clock somewhere. Mm-hmm. It's already past five o'clock in New York, so it's time. It's wine o'clock. Right. Exactly. And if you'd like some, yes, you you can help us finish this uh, when we're done with the panel. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Okay. So I'm Theda Sanford. I am. VP of Digital Marketing for Republic Records, and I will be your moderator. We're going to do different types of uh, introduction. We're not going to sit here and give you a book about who we are, what do we do. We're just each going to share our names, our work affiliation, and one thing that inspires us. So I'm inspired by helping people's dreams come true. That's why I do what I do in the music business. So we're going to start at the end with Xavier. Hi, my name is Xavier Ramirez, and I'm with Social Sound System. That's my company. I do online marketing and branding and tour marketing for a number of bands. What Um, inspires you, Xavier? No book. (laughs) Oh, yeah, sorry. What inspires me? Music and technology and the relationship they share and how that pushes culture forward. Taylor. Hi, I'm Taylor from CrowdSurf. We are a social media agency, and I am inspired by fans. Hi, I'm Kathy Baker from Columbia Records, and I am inspired to have the freedom to be creative in my job. Allie? Answer. I am Allie Schluter. I'm the VP of Digital Marketing at Island Def Jam, and I am inspired by creativity as well for all of my musicians. Okay, great. So (laughs) we were just up in the room talking about various campaigns and things that we thought were cool, and we were trying to share lots of examples with you. We're going to have an opportunity at the end for you guys to ask questions and share some cool examples of things you've done. So we're just going to have a conversation, and you guys are a part of it, okay? So I wanted to start with a bunch of the different content types that or rather marketing tactics are related to content. So you have social marketing, content marketing, mobile marketing. There's so many different angles, and everyone at this, on this panel kind of has their hands in some piece of that. So I'm going to start with you, Xavier, with a content marketing example of something that you've worked on recently that you felt was really compelling for driving some sort of stream. Some sort of stream. Recently, one of my bands, Iration, played at the Fillmore and Wiltern. They both sold out both shows. We worked with sound tracking and Uber to create a giveaway. Basically, fans just took a picture and added one of our songs from the new album on there and drove 1,500 clicks and maybe 60 entries. But some fan got a pair of tickets and $150 Uber credit. So that's pretty awesome for them, and they got to get to the show safe. So, so the streams were through through sound tracking? Well, you, you, you can get streams there for 30-second streams through iTunes, or if they're connected to Spotify, that would be a stream, or RDO if that's in their account. Um, they also have an option to play the YouTube videos in there, so however those fans wanted to interact with them, I'd, I'd say. Allie. <laughs> Some sort of content marketing example that drove streaming revenue. Right? Something the three of us on this side are think about streams in terms of revenue. So, well, I wouldn't really. I don't know if it's streaming revenue that it drove because we did something it, to prepare for a release, and that was the Kanye West projections on the side of the building, which was sort of social and content marketing. Um, so basically, you know, an hour before these projections were supposed to go in 66 countries around the world, Kanye tweeted, drove it back to his website. There was a heat map with all the different locations. Multiple locations in New York, in sorry, in New York. So it, it didn't necessarily drive streams at that point because there was nothing available for streaming. But it certainly did drive marketing awareness for the record, and that was our big campaign. It happened like basically right after he performed on SNL. So you know, it was definitely the video where you could see on the sides of these buildings that created the awareness for the for the album. Was there an iTunes pre-order available at that time? There was no iTunes pre-order available at that time. <laughs> it was just a big promotional stunt that we sort of did that we worked with Kanye on, and, and uh, it definitely created a huge splash in awareness around the record release. But mostly press. Oh, mentioned. tons of press and about probably close to a million social mentions, tweets, probably over you know 12,000 blog postings and worldwide news a couple of the locations did get shut down so 
and then it happened over the course of the next three weekends leading into the release. Got it. Yeah. And there was no pre-order up at the time? Theta. I, I'm just saying, it's like, a part of me, I, I'm of the mindset that why do marketing if you're not going to influence a sale? I agree with you. <laughs> okay. So it's Kanye's fault. No comment. Okay. <laughs> Kathy, what about you? We actually had a, a similar campaign, which was location-based, uh, for J. Cole. Two weeks before release, we had a, a number of silent listening parties that were happening at the same time um, across nine different markets. And so we used an app called um, Listener to help us execute that. And basically, what Listener does is it puts out a frequency that picks up that's integrated into the audio and then uh, detects that you are at that location and will push content to your phone. So 8 o'clock Eastern in multiple markets, we had a synchronized audio stream of the full album. Um, In New York specifically, we had two um, locations, one for fans and one for press, and it drove a ton of conversation as being, you know, just something creative, something exciting that we had done with this new uh, mobile app partner. And, you know, immediately after, we actually launched uh, a full SoundCloud stream of the album. Um, in, in this case, our pre-order was up, and we started seeing some really strong numbers from that, too. Well, you did send me before. It was uh, 5,200 pre-orders as a result of the uh, right. promotion. Right. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your big launch and rollout for Britney. Sure. So, uh, work a little bit with Britney Spears, and we had to um, roll out the announcement of her Vegas residency. Um, And for her, the biggest thing we decided to do was to be very strategic and not cloud our marketing at all. Every piece of content we put out in the world was to become a major press piece. So, the first piece of that was we launched a a countdown on her site. seems super simple, but it got picked up everywhere, tweeted about, printed, and... Um, press and even made it onto television. Actually, like ET covered the, a screenshot of the site, which is in, which is super awesome. Um, and from that point forward, we just took pieces of content like her being a picture in the studio, her writing a piece of lyrics, her hinting at um, the title of her song inside of a hidden side of a tweet. We would do something maybe every couple days. Um, and because we were so strategic about it and did not have any contests, promos, nothing surrounding it, every single thing that she said was a major piece of uh, press that moved along this campaign until eventually we made it to the desert and she revealed that she was going to be in Vegas for two years on this live stream that popped up on her site after the countdown was up. So it seems like a lot of these campaigns are really kind of tied to press. And as I feel back to the early days of digital marketing, Uh, Remember when press people did not talk to blogs? And that was like our jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, So, is is it? (laughs) I mean, that's a a, how much how much collaboration is there now? And are are the press people getting with the program? I think so. Um, I mean, I think they have to because all of the traditional magazines have pretty much folded. So. They have to really get in touch, but in terms of when we're setting up our artists, you know, digital press days, that still falls in my world. But there's, you know, collaboration. Yeah, we've we've recently moved the blog interaction to the publicity team for sure, and they've actually had to staff up for it because there's so many more outlets to deal with. Um, But, you know, we're there to help identify which ones are are making a difference um, and which ones we need to target, and then we'll work together. To, to work, you know, and get some coverage. Xavier, you're more DYI. Are you, are, are you, you probably have to do press and be the webmaster and yeah. do the touring and... Yeah, I mean, I mean, we pick up a lot of stuff mainly that's just in our niche community. I mean, we come from, like, Sublime and Slightly Stupid and that California carrying the torch for that scene and jam. So there is, I mean, not many blogs want to cover us, and it's mainly the fans who are just kind of doing it themselves and you know then I'm just like doing Evernote PDF clippings and tracking it all myself (laughs) so how do you sort of you know when you have UGC content or sort of a conversation that's happening amongst fans how do you how do you put a microphone on that how do you make that so much bigger well for all of our tours I mean we source a lot of fan content images like um, we're using this 
site crowdalbum.com pulls in all the fan Instagram, Vine, Twitter photos, and we go source through that and we'll find a cool fan photo, recognize them with credit, share it the next day. Fans look and see, wow, there's a lot of hot chicks at that show. I want to go <laughs> to the next time it's in town, you know. So that's one example for to try and activate those. Got it. Sorry, I said chicks. Sorry. <laughs> Most of the shows I go to are Sausage Fest, so I... <laughs> and I'm tweeting, like, yeah, all my single friends, you wish you were here. Right? <laughs> um, I think most of us up here are somewhat immune. Um, so it's all right. um, what about UGC, Kathy? Do you use UGC as part of your marketing and maybe an example of one that you've used recently? Yeah, uh, one hundred percent. We we work on One Direction, so everything is UGC for One Direction. Um, and so, try to make it short. You know, we built out a campaign for One D when they were first uh, signed to Columbia Records um, through our UK counterpart and our label, and uh, we created competitions. And it was eight or nine competitions for fans to create UGC. Um, to win a performance uh, by 1D when they arrive in the U.S. So we saw tremendous growth there. When we first signed them, we had about thirty or 40,000 U.S. fans on Facebook. And by the time we were done with that campaign, we were up past 250,000. And then once they arrived and we released an album a few months later, we were already at a million. Um, so a lot of it was, you know, giving the fans, you know, a competition giving them something to work towards, and then ultimately rewarding them with the performance. So Kathy just described an organic way to build Facebook fans. Taylor, do you working for an independent digital marketing agency, do you still get phone calls from people saying, can you buy Facebook likes for me? Do uh, people still ask for that? Every day. Uh. Every day. Even on, it goes to Twitter, it goes to Instagram. Um, not so much with the big artists, but mostly with the developing developing acts, and they have the managers calling saying, "How do we get more numbers? We've got to like we've got to move faster. We need to buy. I've seen all these other people buy numbers. We got to do it." And when I talk to them, it's you know I have to tell them that I think nowadays people are looking in terms of what's effective and what's not is um, what's your rate of engagement. Yeah. For me, engagement is all about an action. It's like it's a retweet. It's a it's a like. It's a comment, um, and that really is what's going to be. The, the teller of what's working and what's not working more so than how many followers or how many likes you have. Yeah, so, s- s- Sure. Go right yeah, ahead. Um, I was, I was going to agree with you there in that fan engagement is important. Like we had uh, another artist reaching out to us. We're like, how did they get more Facebook followers than us? Obviously they're bought and you go on their page and there's only 10 likes or maybe, you know, 20 comments on the page and it just looks empty, you know? So how do you change their minds? Because, you know, this is the music business. It's a chart game. Everyone looks at who's number one, and, you know, too bad if you're not number one. Like, literally, everyone wants to be number one and have big numbers, but uh, not only one person can be number one. How do you get them to realize that it's more about engagement than the number of followers? I tend to pair them next to, to artists that are very similar to them in terms of like stacked up numbers and engagement and show them that what we're doing is actually improving maybe not necessarily the numbers but the engagement on each post that we do or from a promo that we, we put together. If you, sh- you know, we had a, one of our uh, people at our office went on tour with 98 Degrees this year and they were concerned about their numbers and what she did was put them next to the other people on the roster and showed like, hey, maybe your number is not as high on your social platforms, but look at the engagement of the photos you're tweeting out every night or the, the tweets you're replying to all your fans after every show. This is showing that you are touching your fans so much closer than any of these other acts on the tour. So, I just got a question for an audience, just a show of hands. How many of you look at your Facebook insights on a weekly basis and say, oh, that worked, that didn't work? Uh, nice. Okay, everybody. Wow. Yay, everyone in here is awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do we like the new Facebook insights? From, I mean, yeah. yeah? What do you like about it? Well, I was going to say, you know, when one thing I've been doing as independent is I'll send over my next big sound reports for the last, you know, 30, 90 days, and that shows everything else beyond, what you know, everything I plugged in for analytics, websites, 
YouTube views, engagements across everything, and then that kind of gives brands or sponsors a better idea. It's like, oh, this they have some cloud. It's not just that Facebook like mm-hmm. number. So you pay for Dexpix Found for that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think it's also you have to look at like where your artist is the strongest. Like maybe they ha- like their Vine game is amazing, or their Instagram photos are amazing, but their Facebook like usually the label runs the Facebook page at this point because it's it's a news post and everybody's on there. And I personally am seeing like not as many people liking artists on Facebook because you know there's so much noise on there and you're getting pictures of your high school friend's baby every five seconds you know or you know some housewife that's at home tweeting her entire life or facebook so i just feel like it's one element of many that you need to look at for the engagement of an artist not just like facebook insights and growth and things like that there's so many other platforms out there maybe they're on you know some sort of app that they're engaged with and you can see the growth there as opposed to just facebook Okay, well let's let's talk about that. What what are our favorite apps right now for for marketing? So I'm going to start with you, Xavier. Um, just to continue on what Ali said was, um, it's hard to how do you convince people that Facebook isn't the end all be all? And when you look at something like, you know, I just come back to sound tracking because our artists have, you know, one of them has like forty thousand followers or you know, one hundred and twenty thousand followers there, or our SoundCloud account with all these followers. Like proportionally, if you look at your Facebook, or I mean your your Twitter and Instagram numbers. Sometimes, like these other networks, are still niche, but you have a lot more engagement there, and those are, that's where your fans are. And maybe, like, soundtracking is really big in South America and Mexico, so we're touching a different base now. You know, right? Kathy, I still like Instagram. Instagram's great um, for a lot of our artists. Vine is still a lot of fun um, to work with. So. Those two, I think, we're starting to focus around, and we we talked a little bit about Snapchat and figuring out Snapchat for us. Um, I know they're building out some new functionality, so I think that would be something that we can, you know, start using for marketing. Are you f- noticing that particular genres of artists are gravitating towards, uh, uh, say, Instagram over Instagram video over Vine video, or, or is it just whatever someone likes? Um, I don't think I don't think we're seeing any trends quite yet. Um, it's really where they're comfortable. A lot of the content's coming directly from them. We're not feeding it. Um, it's wherever they're comfortable. So, for example, Beyonce found comfort in Instagram, so she's using that in Tumblr. So did Rihanna. Yeah. <laughs> and every time I see a Rihanna post, I I I I suck in my teeth and feel bad for you because I'm like, oh God! Remember when we were the ones that posted for all the artists? Right. It took me so long to get her on Twitter. It was like, and I was like, but everybody's doing it. And she would say, but Beyonce is not. Right. And I'm like, but everybody else is doing it. You have to get on Twitter. You have to have your voice. Well, and then, woo. And then, right there we go. Hello, Instagram. It's all out there. <laughs> it's, it's all out there. <laughs> what about you, Taylor? A, a favorite app that you're using with your artists right now? Yeah, I mean, actually, I actually would like to continue on the Snapchat. Um, that's actually one of my all-time favorites right now. Um, and I get a lot of flack from managers and label counterparts that say, like, hey, how, why are you using this? You can't track the number of people that are snapping you. There's no, like, profile that shows how many followers you have. But... For me, it's important to uh, for my artists to communicate with their fans the same way that their fans communicate with their friends. That's the most empowering thing an artist can do is to, you know, if you have a friend snapping their other friend, but then they get a snap from a celebrity, it's like, oh, my God, this is incredible. I can't believe you got a Snapchat from, you know, whoever. Um, so that's the biggest thing for me is uh, I just pick the things like Kick is another one, too. It's a little – it's just like a messaging app, and there's not a way to track followers, but – young kids in the team demo are messaging each other day in and day out using this app so why not get our artists on doing the same thing I'm going to answer my own question from before (laughs) I am noticing that for my EDM artists they are more likely to use Vine Mm -hmm. and that my hip hop artists are all about Instagram video Mm -hmm. and my alternative rock artists they just go across the board Mm -hmm. but the EDM artists are coming up with, you know, they're practicing dance moves or doing funny, making light right. shows that just kind of fits into the kind of raver type atmosphere of the music. Right. Maybe the loop is making it more fun yeah. for them. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so let's 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 do let's play a little game. All right, we're gonna, it's called uh, 
Spotify versus RDO and why? <laughs> you have the deer in the hard, head. Such a hard question, Theta. Well, you know, everyone in here has an opinion. I'm curious. I'm sure they were curious about yours. I, I like both. I use both. And I'm not saying that for political reasons. I think that RDO is a better UI. And I just think it's cleaner than Spotify. Um, I have a major problem right now with Spotify's recommendations. And I thought it was amazing that BuzzFeed said, Spotify, why are you so drunk? I don't know if everybody saw that, but you should check it out. Because it was true. Um, I think some of their search functionality on Spotify is bad. But for me, I'm still a user because I'd rather pay $10 a month and kind of consume all the music that I want whenever, whenever I want it. And... You know, I think that RDO um, is getting a little bit more aggressive with their marketing, which is amazing. I think that there should be healthy competition in the marketplace. And again, it's whatever you sort of gravitate towards. I know people that are like hardcore Slacker users or people that are just like, I love Pandora. And we were talking before about iRadio. And, you know, I think it's just what you're sort of used to and what you like and gravitate towards. And I use them all. A non-committal answer. Okay. (laughs) I use them all. Kathy? Um, I agree. I think RDO has um, good marketing. They're very, you know, they're getting very aggressive with marketing. We did launch an MGMT album stream with them recently, which performed really well. And a lot of that was because of their marketing um, and the dollars that they put behind it. Um, I personally love Spotify. Um, And I also like what they're starting to do on the marketing side and launching different programs. They recently launched um, their Landmark um, campaign um, where you can hear about the contributors to an album and hear from the other players that, you know, who are part of a, you know, big project. So I I like some of the things that they're working on. I think they're going down the right road. And I noticed they're starting to incorporate some video stuff, which looks a little bit, you know... (laughs) Not cool right now, but I'm sure they can figure it out and it'll look better. Taylor, when we were upstairs, you were talking about some of the apps that you like to use on Spotify with some of your artists. Do you want to talk about some of those and give an example for the room? Sure. Yeah, uh, I think Spotify kind of has the lead in terms of uh, like third-party app integration inside of the inside of the platform. Um, Something that we're trying to put together right now for uh, Robin Thicke, actually, is um, he wants to, he's actually going on tour next year, and we want fans to kind of curate the set list for him. Um, So there's an app inside of it called Top 10, where fans can go in and submit their top 10 favorite Robin Thicke songs, and the app will kind of compile all those and show what the ultimate top 10 songs are that people have curated from their Spotify, from Robin's catalog. So, um, yeah. Is he really going to use that list? To <laughs> I think he'll take it into consideration. <laughs> into consider. Ah, marketing ploy. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about you, Xavier? Um, I I use both as well. Um, part of the reason I use both is because, well, my artists say I keep getting kicked off. Can you get me an RDO account, or can you get me like basically they want their own? Oh, because they share the they, account. Yeah, they'll share the account. So. Um, RDO has their artist referral program, so I mean we use that for that in that respect too. But I personally prefer Spotify. I think I like RDO better from the user perspective, and it's pretty, it's nice. It's uh, but they don't push to Tumblr, so my blog's on Tumblr. So (laughs) I think it's funny because we all like. We all agree that RDO actually has a better user interface, yet personally use Spotify. I mean, I think there's something. Mm -hmm. The social and the apps. The social social and the apps apps. are good, yeah. Because of the apps. That's the distinguishing factor. Mm -hmm. Um, And you don't have app fatigue? I mean, I certainly do. Every time someone tells me about a new app, my eyes glaze over. (laughs) We also talked about how those apps don't don't work on mobile, though. They don't work on mobile. So if I wanted to use, like, the really cool app everyone's talking about, or if, or if you know, some marketing team wants me to go on SoundDrop with my artist, then like I can't use that because you know, 70% of our artists, like or our fans, I can see are using mobile or accessing our accessing our website on mobile. So, how are they supposed to use these Spotify apps if they're you know? Well, let's talk a little bit more about mobile because uh, it is probably for at least me, it's where I spend probably 85% of my time uh, because. Um, Almost all the iTunes sales are coming from your mobile phone. 
Um, at least for us, we just got some research back that showed that 80% of our sales for Republic Records is actually happening from a mobile phone. And that might have something to do with the fact that 70% of all our advertising is actually focused on the mobile phone now. So um, killed all the artist vanity apps. It's like we're not in the app business. We're, we're, how do we enable putting our music in front of all these other um, mobile apps that have that are working very hard to build audience and kind of get in the middle of that conversation. What is your current mobile strategy over at Columbia Cathy? <laughs> we do need to do more advertising. That's definitely um, a room, you know, room for us to grow um, at Columbia. It's just kind of figuring out the mobile advertising strategy. We'll look at case studies from time to time, and we'll see, you know, that it's absolutely effective, and that's where we need to be. Um, so, actually, part of my uh, reason for coming out here was to actually meet with a couple of people who can help us with that. Um, so, you know, mobile marketing, yes, we could do that all of the time. Advertising is where we need to really focus. I, I agree. The click-through rates on mobile advertising are so much higher than they are on display ads on websites. I still have to deal with an artist that wants to go to World Star Hip Hop and see their site skin take over. Although I will say that World Star Hip Hop ads perform really well for us, probably the highest out of any other site takeover. Um, but, you know, I always say to our marketers at the label that you have to advertise on mobile because it's just it just gets a higher click through rate and that's more important than, you know, an impression on on a site. Um, as far as our mobile strategy, I mean, I, I love that you killed all those artist apps. I can't stand them. I've had to do them. Some of them have worked really well. Um, I just tell the managers I won't pay for them, so yeah. then that all then they just go away. Yeah. Well, we actually, I have to say that um, we did one. We had one with Bon Jovi, and you wouldn't think that Bon Jovi would be like a forward-thinking digital band. Quite the contrary. Mm. Um, they're actually willing to try a lot of new digital initiatives, and they had a mobile app, a mobile roadie app from a long time ago with about maybe 150,000 installs, which is pretty big for, for you know, a, a standard web-type app that is just news and nothing really exciting about it. And, um, you know, they came to us on the last album, and they wanted to do a QR code. I'm like, we're not doing a QR We are not doing a QR code. Nobody knows what they are. They're awful. You have to install some sort of, you know, if you don't have the software, people don't know how to use it. So I said to them, why don't we do something, you know, augmented reality? And they had this whole kooky, like, you know, graffiti sort of artwork by this artist. Um, I said, let's make that augmented reality. Let's premiere some of your content within your app, your existing app. So we tied in an app that I know you're aware of. It's called UView, which is a universal music group augmented reality app. Push that through the app. Everything that we premiered, whether it's a new song, um, an interview with John about the record, um, you know, 90-second clips of the new music video before it came out on Vivo or anywhere else, premiered in that app, and we basically doubled our install numbers. And it was great, and it's been a great marketing tool, and they've used it on their tour to get people to, you know, do meet and greets or, you know, come closer to the stage or whatever. So um, I will say that, um, you know, that app in particular has been pretty successful for us in terms of a standard artist app. But now I'm killing them all. Vanity <laughs> artist app. Exactly. Um, Xavier, do you got, what are you guys using for mobile for your... Um, Slightly Stupid has a mobile roadie app with about 30,000 downloads and... The way we do it is for tour marketing is we schedule out posts a few days before. Or like when we do, when we announce shows, we'll do targeted like 100 mile radius to those fans with those installs around, say, San Diego. And then we'll do it, come back to it maybe a week out or maybe like two or three days out. And that's that's one way to do it. But it is it is very much a one way street of just pushing content and trying to get them back there. Um, and then as far as um, advertising, yeah, we click the mobile for Google AdWords, we'll click the mobile optimization ones and kind of uh, bid higher on those as well. So. so, and I'm just trying to, and forgive me if I'm spacing on it, maybe it's Michael uh, having a, my sip of wine here, but um, <laughs> when we were upstairs, we were talking about uh, different types of ad units, so uh, buying uh, Twitter-sponsored posts, 
um, some of the dark post ad units that are available on Facebook. I know this stuff is, may seem kind of boring, but it is part of marketing, actually knowing how to kind of place your advertising and retarget your users. Um, did you guys have anything around on that that you want to use? Was it you? Well, said? I mean, I think we were we were actually talking about Twitter advertising and like who uses it and who doesn't use it. And you know, I I use it for certain campaigns. I mean, when the whole Big Sean Kendrick Lamar control craziness came out, we definitely did a, a buy around that because it was trending for so long. But our spends are really small sometimes, so you just have to make sure that you use it wisely. But I think it makes sense if you have an artist on an award show. Um, like the BET Awards that are coming up, the Hip Hop Awards. So many people are watching TV and tweeting at the same time. We all know this. And so if you do an ad around that, you do see a higher click-through and hopefully potentially purchase to that ad around integration or connection with a TV show and your artist. I see you leaning forward. You have something you want to say, Taylor. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the what you just touched on of being on the pulse with the way you're using your Twitter advertising. And I think something that we do on our end is um, we can kind of gauge when we're going to cause a trend from one of our artists. So what we'll do is we'll set up a promoted tweet based on the trend that we're going to cause. And there's lots of different techniques of how we do it. There's follow sprees, there's Q&As, there's live chats. But we get... Interscope actually works really well with us on this. They will take a tweet from their own account and promote it based on the trend that we're going to cause and have that be towards a buy of the album on iTunes or a view of the video on YouTube. Um, so to the fans, it looks like we've caused like a really organic trend. But when people, when you get all those um, organic impressions on the, on the trend feed, we're getting all of those impressions directly to what we're trying to sell. So it's kind of a little trickery, but um, at the end of the day, it works. So uh, how about another kind of like old, almost old school tactic in digital marketing would be email marketing. Mm-hmm. How, what's the newfangled way that you're sort of repurposing email to reach audiences today? So I'm going to start with you, Xavier, at the end because you have lots of bands touring. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same thing. It's a, we, we do targeted tour announces. We you know, create just one specific tour image, ticket link focus it get maybe some words from the band and maybe the official video and we'll just push that targeted to each tour market you know a month out week out maybe a few days before and that's just how we have to do it for do it yourself because you know you're still working on the monetization side of things for the getting the bands or sometimes the managers wrap their heads around that kathy are you using it for besides uh a tour announcement, but maybe uh, segmenting your messaging based on which social platform someone might use that email address to sign in or log in? Yeah, we are. I mean, you know, we were talking earlier. It's, you know, the people on the email list are really your super fans. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes a little bit more effort to sign up. You know, it's not just liking a page or following. They actually are uh, going and signing, you know, putting in their info and their age and all that good stuff. Um, so, and then from a, from the labor pers- perspective, it's important, you know, to have access to those fans because um, the artists and the managers are starting to um, control a lot of the social media. So we start to lose a little bit of control and communication with the fans. And when it's, in, when it's time to promote an album, we want to be able to do that with the super fans. So, um, whether it's specific to you know social platform, we haven't really segmented it that way, um, but we do you know do certain things where we give away free download um, in order to get some signups um, and continue to grow and engage with that fan base. I also think it's really important too that, um, and we were talking about this a little bit before, but you know you see a platform like MySpace, and it was so important for like you know Rihanna to have like a hundred million fans on MySpace. You don't really know who those fans are now. Nobody's on MySpace. We never got any of that data. Everybody migrated, migrated over to Facebook. And, you know, she's the number one person on Facebook with all these fans, whatever. She has all these Twitter followers. But it's like, you know, you want to be able to capture that data because then you know who your true fan is. Because then when Facebook sort of declines a little bit or there's another platform that comes after Twitter, at least you know that you can continue to market to your fan, And those are your real fans and you can upsell them with you know, tickets or merch or whatever else, you know, CDs. So what's the right mix? How many times, you know, because, you know, 
e- my email is a black hole. I'm sure everyone's email in here is a black, especially today, right? You haven't had a chance to check your email, or you're maybe you're secretly doing it right now because you think we're boring. But <laughs> how many we have times? Wine if you want, yeah. <laughs> how many? How many? How often? What is the right mix? Um, what types of content make the most sense in that email messaging? I mean. You, there's so many different avenues for people to get that message. I subscribe to you on Facebook. I get the automatic email because you've uploaded something on your Facebook. Uh, 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 excuse me, YouTube. Uh, I follow you on Twitter. I, I have my little Twitter list so I can see the people I specifically want to. What is? What are the types of messages, and how often makes sense through email? Anyone. I'll touch on a piece of that. Um, I think one of the coolest new technologies that I've come across in terms of blasting out my emails is take a step back and think when you send, when I send an email to you at the bottom of it, it will say sent from iPhone. When I send it from an artist, it's going to have like copyright, the label or copyright MailChimp, whatever. There's a new technology called upfront that we're working with. And um, what they do is they, by the way that they sign up their users, you're able to have your artist send out blasts that have that, sent from iPhone at the bottom, which is really cool because it's like the artist, like I said before, is talking to you just like you would talk to anybody else or send an email to anybody else. To me, that has been like the most effective way to get a message to people through email because they're going to read it just like they would read any other email. It's not just another spam message or another promotion in their inbox. It's a real email from a, from an artist. When you, do those, do you, when you do those, do you keep them real simple, just text only? Yeah, yeah. very simple, like, text only. Like the Pixies, they're just yeah. simple, easy. Sixty yeah. percent open rate. <laughs> so, but that's interesting because my emails that have an image perform better than the ones that are just text only. So, is it the type of message that you're putting out that makes the difference? You think? I mean, people don't. I think it's more of like a time issue. It's like if we can zip through this really quickly and read it fast, text only, get the message across, done, easy, marketing message heard, over and out. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of the messages that we might be sending out, and for an album cycle, so if we're right on top of release, you might send out a message once or twice um, per week. Um, but a lot of it is exclusive D to C offers, you know, things that really speaks to the super fan again. Um, and I actually have been watching Lady Gaga's email list, and she sends out a lot of like things that are, you know, as a super fan. I'm I'm not a super fan, but I'm just watching. Um, you know, special offers, you know, that's only available to, you know, D2C consumers um, and fans. So not the typical, you know, watch me on, you know, Fallon tonight, you know, type of stuff. I have a question for, with regard to that. Do you ever give first access to like videos, like unlisted um, YouTube videos or like private SoundCloud links just as a reward? Like sometimes we'll, send those to the fans early in the morning and then put it to the socials like later in the afternoon just because, hey, thanks for being on our email list. You know? I think it's important to window content yes. for your super fans so that they so they remain such. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know? Um, and it could be a, alterations of the same piece of content. Um, I mean, we did something similar for Jesse J. Um, so, uh, you know, over here may not mean as much, but uh, internationally, she's a huge megastar. Um, and she wanted to make sure that uh, her fans in different territories saw something because of the international nature of it and all the different time zones we had to take into consideration. So we used actual email to put that in people's boxes before it rolled out on her socials yeah. because... 6 a.m. here is noon and yeah. in the UK, right? Yeah. You know, so something to consider. Yeah, window window and content is so important. Mm-hmm. And if you can do that with the email subscribers first, it's great. Mm-hmm. Often, you know, we have such volume coming through, it's not the perfect rollout, but yeah. when you can, it's really a, the right strategy. So generally in rolling out... Um, a single or an album there's a couple of pieces of content that we create so it might be and that content could be I got a uh, the track listing the album art uh, a single a lyric video a music video maybe a BTS video that's probably like six pieces of content but a rollout cycle might be three to six months 
what other content types do you create to sort of supplement those sort of six major things that, you know, most marketing and product managers get, but there's all the stuff that happens in between that that falls into the realm of digital marketing. What are the ones that you think are the most effective? Allie? I I was going to say, I think um, definitely like a live stream or a live chat or Google Hangout with an artist one-on-one because that connects directly with the fan. Um, I mean, I think you can also get a little bit creative too. We did something with um, Big Sean and SoundCloud where, you know, he basically got his start because he freestyled for Kanye, waiting for him outside of a radio station. Kanye discovered him and basically signed him and the rest is history. So we kind of were like, well... You know, his first album is finally famous. His second album is Hall of Fame. So we're like, why don't you do something for your fans and give your fans the opportunity to create 16 bars where then you can judge and who knows, maybe somebody will get a record deal or whatever. So you just have to sort of think of these different marketing campaigns to engage outside of the normal content that we might not be able to get or window for the fans. But it's like other opportunities that engage your fans with the artist that might give them the chance to feel special or feel like, wow, Big Sean really listened to my record or, you know, I, I made this for him and, you know, he's going to shout me out on Twitter and, you know, boost so, my computer. UGC. Yeah. Um, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> that's okay, but it was a detailed answer. Yeah. Taylor, oh, I'll get to you in a second. Taylor, yeah. so you had some other UGC-type content ideas upstairs. Did you want to share any of those now? Or... Or any other type of sort of content that is that you're creating that kind of fills in the gap from the big six? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I think part of it is being creative and kind of finding a way to elongate each of those pieces of content. So if you have a behind the scenes, why not take stills from it, you know, six, seven, eight, and roll them out on places like Instagram and Facebook where photos are key to really draw out that piece of content so it has some longevity to it. Um and well, then shorten that piece of content, you know, instead of having a three minute video, you have three one minute videos. You know? Exactly. Um, yeah, and I think Instagram video has been a huge proponent in that sense of being able to tease content before it comes out or taking content and refreshing it to fans by cutting it up into 15 second pieces. Um, thank God for preloaded videos on Instagram. Um, yeah. And, and then I think in addition to like the live chats that you mentioned, Q and A's are huge for, for some of my artists, um, whether it be on Twitter or Facebook has been a really cool place to try experimenting with Q and A's now. And then actually I do a lot of Q and A's too directly on YouTube feeds. So if we're trying to drive to a certain number of views on a video, the way to drive traffic is to get the artist to jump on their um, their YouTube account and just say that they're going to be on the YouTube comment stream and answer questions and just drive a ton of people there to just be watching the video and responding to comments. Now so. that they have threaded comments on like in the past week, that makes it so much easier to actually do that. You yeah. can actually follow the conversation. Totally. What about Reddit AMAs in terms of like, okay. I like this. I like, you like those? I like them a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, I just like Reddit He's in general. He's a subredditor. Yeah. I see. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I mean. He did. Like, Slightly Stupid, we do, um, you know, usually for kicking off tours like we did with Atmosphere this year and last year, we um, we were a 311 on their tour. But the bands love it because it's direct interaction with their fans. And, like, they, they'll have me, like, texting them questions, like, weeks after. Be like, hey, keep sending me questions. Like, I want to answer as many as I can because – it's it's just real and it's like not some PR question that they've answered a million times before. It's funny because uh, uh, we have the weekend and he is notorious for just not doing interviews. He just doesn't like doing them. So when he agreed to do an a, a Reddit AMA and he's like, I'll do it this afternoon. Of course, we had no time to promote it, but he tweeted, <laughs> I'm doing an AMA. And qu- the questions he was answering, I mean, his A&R guys, I never knew that story about his grandmother. I mean, like, Re, they they so get into it and that got picked up and the stories that the blogs picked up off of that like the all the blogs that have been tweeting and asking me can I get an interview it was like there was their interview right there yeah. so it, it's, it's pretty amazing okay so we have about 15 minutes left I want to get to your questions but before we do that uh, so who's got the mic so that people who have them can start lining up Right up here in the center, if you haven't come up to the front. Okay, I radio, yay or nay, go down the line, starting with you, Xavier. Okay, I did the Beatles, 
radio station, and I said nay after a while because I heard the same songs in the morning and then later in the afternoon. But then I went and did like a massive attack station, and then I was hanging out all afternoon, and it was good. And I was I'm moving, so that helped. <laughs> okay, Taylor, yay or nay? Nay. It's to me, it's basically a way for it benefits iTunes and not the fan. At the end of the day. <laughs> okay. What if it's the, the one click to buy it if you choose to download it? That right. could be a fan benefit or no? Mm, not so much? It's oh. a label benefit. <laughs> well, of course, we think that. <laughs> what about you, Kathy? Yay or nay? Can I go in between? Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anyone I, from, my, from iTunes in here. From so. a, as a music fan, I was just okay about it. From the label perspective, I like it because it is it puts you in the environment where you can purchase the music. So like an iTunes full album stream, we like those because it puts you in that environment to go ahead and purchase the album right away. Um, but as a fan, not so much. Allie? I think it's too early for me to make that decision. I need to spend more time with it across all the different genres and really see what the programming is. So I can't really answer that today. Non-committal but, answer. Non-committal again. But I am supportive of it. I think, you know, and especially f- putting my label hat on, it's a direct, hopeful purchase to a download or an album, and that's how we keep our lights on. It was yeah. nice to just turn it on your Apple TV, and there it was, you know. I'm curious, because there's always a discussion from a, from a research standpoint, how much streams drive downloads. Mm-hmm. And the data will be within... Um, iTunes and hopefully they'll be generous and share it. <laughs> okay, questions from the audience. No questions. Cool things you guys want to share from your own digital mark. Ah, oh, everybody's got something they want to share. Typically, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Can you stand up and say who you are first, Scott? Uh, my name is Scott Goodman. I'm with uh, yourlisten.com. Um, the question I had is who typically within the hierarchy of the record label determines which social media platforms to use, whether, okay, I'm going to upload this promo to MySpace, or do I upload it to SoundCloud, or do you utilize all them? And who's the person within the label that typically decides that? Is it, uh, is it someone at the label, or is it the publicist, is it the manager? Definitely not the publicist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I, I, all, la- all labels are promo guy. All labels are different. I, I, at Republic, we work with our managers and make recommendations. Sometimes they want to make that decision themselves. But it really, it's about who your audience is, what that content is, and what the goals are of that content. So if, if we want to be in the social graph, we're going to look at posting something that allows you to like and share and hit people's walls. If it's about expanding the reach of a conversation, we might choose to put it into Twitter. If it's very visually oriented, we, we, we might decide it's Instagram or one of the other video outlets. And maybe in some instances, yes, we still do put some things on, on MySpace because we found that for audience artists that have international demographic, that it is still actually an effective place to reach those people. Even though all of us in this room probably think, yeah. But yeah. If, I, if, they have, uh, if they have numbers from, the, from international territories... They don't have that New York uh, sort of West Coast mentality. It, the people who live in those flyover states actually still go on that site. Yeah. There's still a community there. It's true. Yeah. So, okay. Anyone else? I was going to say it's a collaborative effort. I mean, I actually did get into a discussion over the Pusha T album release and where we were going to premiere it, and the publicist wanted NPR, and I was like, I don't think we should do NPR, and I actually got like approval to do it on SoundCloud. I'm like, it should just be everywhere, and then it was all this back and forth, and then about a half hour ago, I got an email that it's premiering on MySpace today, and I was like, what happened and why? And I can't even respond. But um, I guess there is some sort of advertising that MySpace has given the artist manager. So, but it was actually like a really heated discussion as to where we should premiere this record. And then it was like, let's just let it leak and then let's get it out there. And so, um, but it depends. Honestly, on the content, the artist, the manager, case by a case. Lot of for times- every, every artist is different. A lot of people think like we have these cookie cutter promotions, but that's not at all true 
Yeah, a lot of times we'll make a decision and then it, next, you know, okay, we're going to do a Vivo premiere for this yeah. video. Mm-hmm. And then I get an email from Vivo saying, yeah, it's on Worldstar. I'm like, yeah. It's like, yeah. Like every time it's something from Drake, I just know I shouldn't even bother to plan a premiere because <laughs> we'll discuss it. We'll have meetings. There'll, uh-huh. be, uh, there'll be lots of uh, really well thought out discussions about what we're going to do. And it, the artist just does what they want to do. It happens. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, Jeremy from Concord Music Group. I uh, wanted to know about uh, Next Big Sound, Music Metric, Radiant 6, the different data tracking, conversation tracking tools. Do you guys use them? Do you like them? And how do you use them? And I think the most important question I like to ask is, how do they change the way you do your job or do business? Okay. I use Next Big Sound, and I use Sysmos. It's really important for me to track social conversation. It's not always the easiest thing to do, especially within Sysmos. And for a lot of my artists, when somebody says, this song is the shit, that comes up as a negative connotation when it's really positive. So I never go by the percentages of what is positive and negative. But you can still get a feed for social conversation in real time. And um, I use that to really look at a record to see if something is if people are responding to it or if they're not responding to it. So, and then next big sound, I just need to know sort of like growth in different socials. Um, and they track pretty much everything, you know, Instagram. Um, I keep asking for vine. I keep asking for Instagram videos. Um, there's a couple Shazam. Hi Jeff. Um, I keep asking for a lot of different metrics to sort of like tell what this all means. So then I can report it back to my company and say, this is what's going on. This is how it's compared to. This is what it actually means. You know, having a number or a trending video on YouTube, what does that mean? I always get asked that. What does it mean? So it's sort of my job to kind of explain to the rest of the company what it means. Yeah, we use um, Radiant 6, Next Big Sound. We also have been reusing um, Crimson Hexagon recently uh, for sentiment. And uh, so, you know, all these tools you look at and you use the data behind it, but I think some of it is also gut. Um, and knowing where to go, uh, doing some, you know, looking manually to look at what the feedback is um, so that you could share the right feedback, you know, to the executives and to the artist as well. I don't use any of those tools for sentiment because they not, none of them work for sentiment. I only use it for what the reach of the conversation is and the percentage of the share that my artist has in that conversation. Mm-hmm. And how do we grow that? Uh, so the other thing that I'm looking at is the language in which people are using to talk about the artists and rewrite all my advertising for my retargeted messaging in that language so that I'm speaking directly to people. Other questions? Hunter, right here. <laughs> I suppose this would be a question for all of you collectively, but in your experience with new artists, what do you find is the most effective social media platform for generating new fans? Taylor, th- yeah. that's you. Cool. Yeah, for me, it's um, <clears throat> Twitter and Instagram, but mostly Twitter. Um, Twitter has been the driving force for actually many years now for me in terms of really connecting my artists to their fans, and that's the sole purpose of what I do on a day-to-day basis good example of that is when artists go on tour after every show i make sure that they sit down and look at the tweets to them about their show and reply to a few of them could be five could be 50 could be 100 but when you do that you are really solidifying that relationship with that fan because you took the time to show that the artist read the tweet about the show are grateful for the fact they came to the show and responded to that fan and really made that heart-to-heart connection so yeah twitter xavier we should touch on that I agree with Taylor. Uh, Twitter and Instagram, like, I'm fortunate that uh, one of my bands, Iration, they love doing all that stuff, and they're favoriting, they're retweeting. And you see that when you're going through all the hashtags, and you'll find, like, a screenshot of just, like, oh, my gosh, my life is complete. They favorited. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, so that's always good. And they, they also, I mean, a lot of bands is the... I don't know, it's cliche, but it works. It's it's the fan, uh, the stage shot at the end of the shows. Like, those are just... Tag those, yourself if you were at the show. Yeah, they just <laughs> crushes it in performance, you know? And fans were like, I was there. And then you see the comments, and you see fans, like, tagging their friends, like, damn it, why didn't we go? And, and it really makes them feel bad. Or they're like, there I am, front row, you know? And But those are the best engagement, especially for those demographics of users. 
We got time for one more question. Right over here. Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't hating. <laughs> Bring the sunshine. We could use it. Hi, how's it going? Uh, Jim Chowdhury. I'm actually a design MBA student at California College of the Arts, but I have some marketing background uh, in Los Angeles for music. So my question is, is um, you know, in marketing, there's always the question of, well, what does the future look like? And who are you going to market for you in the future? And what are teens using? So do you continue to see like this trend of fragmentation where, you know, before you could say that like MySpace might have been like the encompassing website for everything but now you have like vine and instagram and twitter and it's all over the place and there's not like one that's singularly in command do you see more platforms developing for artists to diversify on because facebook is just terrible to use or you know do you see it coming back full circle what's next is what he's asking i agree i think there's going to be many more platforms for us to play on and just trying to be in all of those places or, or identifying the few that work for that particular artist. Um, but I don't think it's going to come back around to any one solution. Yeah. Our, our Apple? No, because they, they failed at ping. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> no. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just there are a lot of great platforms to work with. And, you know, we start to see where, you know, the fans are. You know, we mentioned Kick. Kick is where the 12 to 19 year olds are sitting or 12 to 17 year olds. So let's go there if we have One Direction or Little Mix or, you know, someone else. Um, so it's, you know, being able, as long as, the, you know, it's easy to use and we can figure out a good way to market our artists, we'll, we'll be there. I have a question for the panel. Are you guys, I've been approached a lot lately with SMS, uh, like exclusive, like fan platforms and opportunities. Are you, guys, are you seeing that? No. No. No, I actually, five years ago maybe. Yeah, we um, were using it for but, yeah about yeah. five years ago. Once Twitter came out, it was, yeah. it was yeah. useless. Or like it was, a, it was a they're, they're framing it as like an exclusive like, or like they're you know custom icons like you know the 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 Snoop Lion app or the the Snoopify app or the Major Laser app like they're framing that as like you can get custom icon badges to text and people I don't know just oh just van- curious. vanity artist apps again no no no, no. like in, within, bon the, Jovi, within the SMS ecosystem now. you know they, honestly I feel like the our target demo is probably smarter than a lot of us and they could probably build that app themselves so I'm going to let them and if it's awesome we'll buy it <laughs> All right, thank you so much for coming. And uh, I'm sure the panelists will be happy to stay and talk to you for a few minutes after the panel. Thanks, Theta.